I pray, Father, in the very name of Christ, that we might come before you here. I don't know who these people are. You know them by name. You know the very hairs on their head. You know their needs. You know the burdens that they carry. You know where they are in their spiritual journey. You know where they are in the prison house of their own sin. We pray tonight that you'll speak through your word, that in this testimony that they might realize that God saves from the guttermost to the uttermost. And that we might all find tonight hope in the age of hopelessness. I ask these favors in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. I've been asked tonight to give and share with you my testimony of how I came to know God. It's called From Gangs to God, the story of a young man in the back streets of New York, a gang leader in the Brooklyn streets that found Jesus Christ. And so I want to share that testimony I want to share it with you tonight because I believe it will help you to know Him. And not only know Him, but to be free in Jesus Christ. You know, there's a growing tendency in our era, in the 21st century, especially even now in the Western world, toward agnosticism. Everywhere I go, traveling around the world, speaking for God, I find men and women that doubt. They question the existence and the reality of God. They ask me in many ways, in different ways, prove to me there is a God. And I hear from others who say they don't even believe in the existence of God, in his atheism. And if one word could sum up the attitude present in our generation as no other time in all history, it's that one word, and that word is doubt. The word doubt. I mean, we hear... This word again and again and again everywhere. We're not, we're reaping the results, by the way, of this doubt. A concentrated effort of materialism and humanism, so-called intellectual denial of existence and the reality of God. If any belief in God today, it's kind of a vague belief. You know, the golf, uh, the great golf course up in heaven. And, you know, God is kind of an absentee landlord. Or, or God is a kind of Santa Claus that if we do so many good things that He's going to give us good gifts. And if He doesn't give us good gifts, we question His existence. I mean, there's a vague idea that there's some supreme being, some kind of power. But in most ways, He's an impersonal being. He's an impersonal God. Men like Robert Ingersoll and other infidels tried to dismiss God and their arguments were on non-existence. And so they argued until the day they died that there was no God and they went darkness into the grave. A Russian cosmonaut some decades ago flew around the outskirts of God's heaven and they came back with a message to the world, the Western world and all the world, that they didn't encounter angels, therefore there is no God. And so their message was, they never saw God even in the heavens. We forgot that God is found in peculiar places. Like in a crib. And on a cross. And in the heart of a dying thief. We've listened to the cries of radical theologians even that said, since God really has no meaning to this generation, really doesn't speak clearly to our mind and to our needs, that since He does not have a burden to touch our needs, He doesn't really exist, but if He exists, He's dead. And so the radical theologians cried that God was dead, while the agnostics cried that God, we don't know, we doubt, and the atheist says there is no God. If God does not speak to the needs of man, then he's not relevant. If he's not relevant, we don't need him. And so humanism raised its ugly head. And it came even into our public school systems. And and, and for three decades, we brainwashed this generation to disbelieve. We've dismissed God from the classroom. We've dismissed the Bible from the classroom and from society. And now we're reaping the results of this. We've taken the Ten Commandments not only off the walls, but we've taken the Ten Commandments out of our hearts. And we're seeing a generation doomed, damned, and bound for hell. It was David the psalmist looking down the scan of time and seeing the Western world in the 21st century. And he was moved to say with these words, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And we hear from a lot of fools today. But tonight I want to declare that God is alive. 
I want to declare that God lives and that God loves and that God saves and, and that Christ, in spite of Robert Ingersoll and other infidels, God is alive. And in spite of Marxist atheism, God is alive. In spite of liberal theologians, He is not dead. He is, resur- he is alive. In spite of humanistic, materialistic and godless system of education, God lives and God loves and God saves. That Christ who lived 1900 years ago in Judea lives now and walks through His Spirit through the streets of Spokane, Washington. And the Christ who touched lives then touches lives now, even the lives of young men on the streets of the great cities of America and the great cities of the, of the world. The footsteps of Jesus are echoing across this great nation and echoing across the great cities. I heard the footsteps of my Lord in the asphalt jungle of New York. I felt the hand reach out and touch the hardened heart of a young man gone berserk, living in a world of hell. A young man with no hope and no future, no direction. I can't prove God. I can't prove God by mathematical equation or putting God into a test tube. How can you put something so majestic and something so mighty and something so lofty in a test tube. If your God can be put in your test tube, your God is too small. Your God is too small. But I know God exists because He exists within me. I believe it because I felt His touch. I mean, I heard His voice. I felt His changing, transforming power. And I was free at last. And by the power of grace, the power of God's grace, I found a way to life. And by the way, that's called in the Bible and Scripture, it's called belief, it's called rebirth, it's called conversion. And by the way, you said you must be born again if you're going to see the kingdom of God. Something has to be born within your heart. Something has to be born in your mind. And it's the power of grace and it changes the life. And you know, man can't explain it outside of the existence of God. How do you explain a young man that lived by the gun? How do you explain a young man who lived by the switchblade? How do you explain to the young man who lived in a world of hate and violence, was touched by his grace and was changed to become a child of God? How do you explain that but the existence of God? Psychologists can't explain it with psychology. Sociologists don't know how to explain it. How a man living on the street, living without hope and then coming in contact with a Judean, coming in contact with a man who lived 1900 years ago and who was resurrected how he could resurrect a new hope in their heart and new future for their lives. They can't explain it outside the Word of God. That this power is available to everyone. Saul was on road to Damascus. Everywhere you look, you find conversion. Saul was on the road to Damascus. He was a rebel without a cause. He was working the street. I mean, he was there to bring the Christians bound to Jerusalem, to persecute them, to snuff out their life as if he could kill them, as if he could imprison them. And when he came up on that road, there was the light from heaven and he fell on his face, Saul. And the word of God says, Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It happened for him on the roadway there on the roadway to Damascus, everywhere you read it. There was Peter by the turquoise blue waters of Galilee, and there was a shadow of Christ. And Peter looked into the face of Christ, and he said, Peter, follow me, and I'll make you become a fisher of men. And that drunken, brawling, fighting fisherman, that tough, stinking, fighting fisherman, his life was changed. And he began to follow Christ. Little did he know where it would lead him. It would lead him to a cross. And he said, I'm not worthy to die like my Lord. Crucify me upside down. And so they turned him upside down. Then his world was right side up. There was a thief dying on the cross for his crimes. Three thieves on the cross, two thieves on the cross and the Savior. And one lifts himself up on the cross and says, if you are the Son of God, take us down from the cross and we'll believe you. He says, if you can take away my pain and take away my suffering and take away my fear, then I will believe you. And the other thief lifts himself on the cross and he says, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he says, friend, with every drop of blood, I'll remember you. You will be with me in the kingdom. But you know the wonderful thing? Their lives were dramatically changed. Happened for Peter by the turquoise blue waters of Galilee. It happened for Saul on the road to Damascus. It happened for a thief. It happened for a thief on a cross outside Jerusalem's walls. It happened for me in Brooklyn, New York. It happened to me in the great city of New York. How many of you have been to New York? Let me see your hands. Well, some of you have lived. 
A lot of people say to me, you're from New York, you're from Brooklyn. That's a good place to be from. But I was born in New York, and New York is a fascinating city. By the way, I've been in the great cities of the world. I've traveled on every continent of the world and been in the great cities and preached in the great cities and worked in the inner cities of the great cities of this country and this world. And let me tell you, it is an exciting city. I mean, bright lights and skyscrapers. and I mean, we go higher up than you go out. And people are fascinated by New York. They come to the bright lights and the honky-tonks and the theaters and the strip joints. And, and they come to the universities and the museums. And, but there's another side of the city. There's a dark side of the city. Not the bright lights and the neon signs. But behind the bright lights and the shadow of the skyscrapers. There in the back alleys of that city, there's another world. Even as there is even in this city, behind the bright lights and behind the suburban homes, there is another story. There's another life. There's another type of living. I mean, it was where death waited in my city. A knife in the ribs. That was my world. You see, a needle in the vein. That was my world. You see, a bullet in the brain. That was, I was born in that city. And by the grace of God, I would be born again in that city. You see... There in Coney Island, I was brought up in a section of Brooklyn called Coney Island. It was the amusement center. But it was also the crime center. By the way, Murder Incorporated functioned there. You heard of the Gallo Boys, the, uh, the Mafia, the Godfather. It was there in Coney Island that Murder Incorporated. And for so much money, you could have someone murdered in my neighborhood. And as a child growing up and as a young boy growing up, many times I would see the, the car come around the corner, the door open, and some dead body thrown out in the street. One day I was going to school, a little child, and, and there laying in the gutter was a man in newspapers. And the newspaper blew away and there was a hatchet in his head. Someone had taken revenge on him. And every day and every week in that neighborhood, someone, someone was shot or stabbed or, or murdered. That was my neighbor. That was my world. It was a world of violence. It was the world of crime. Murder incorporated function. Crime on the organized level. By the way, the largest still in America was there. The head witness against Murder Incorporated was thrown out of the Half Moon Hotel in Coney Island so that they couldn't witness against the Mafia, the Godfather. And as children growing up, we knew the Mafia, we knew the Godfather, we knew and we respect, we looked at them and said, wow, I'd like to be like that. Our model were not the models that you may have in your Christian church or models that you may have in your own home. Not like us, not in our neighborhood. They were our models. I was brought up in a tenement in Brooklyn, Coney Island. I can't describe it. I mean, in fact, my tenement was so ugly and so bad that even in the ghetto, they put it behind all the other tenements, hidden. They were ashamed of it. When my dad and I and the family moved first into it, they had, not, they had no sheetrock on the walls. They, my mama kind of hung, hung up blankets so that they'd separate so you'd know rooms from rooms. And all the time I'm growing up, I'm hating this. I'm blaming my parents. I see everybody else having things and I have nothing and so I, I want and I can't have and, and I'm told I can't have and I don't understand that and, and I'm rebelling against my parents and I blame my parents for, for the poverty. I blame my parents for all the things that were happening and then I, then I started to blame my teachers once I got into school and blame the teachers and blame my parents and, and then I blame the law when I go getting in trouble and put away. I kept blaming the law. They were the reason for where I was. And the bling, big blame argument, blaming everyone but myself. And there I was turning further and away, deeper and deeper in the darkness into that abyss. The hatred grew in my heart. I was what sociologists call sadistic. I got pleasure out of sticking someone with a switchblade. I got pleasure out of running someone down a brick wall, face down a brick wall, stomping them into the pavement. I got pleasure out of hurting. And growing up in the neighborhood, my, my dad was a professional fighter. He's a professional boxer. He had nine fights. He won eight, drew one. My mother said, quit the ring or else. He had five boys. Mama said, quit the ring or else, so he quit the ring. But like every father who wants to be someone, they get their children to be someone. So my dad said... One of my boys are going to be a professional fighter. One's going to be a light heavyweight champion of the world. And so, since I was born big and ugly, 
My dad said, you're going to be the fighter. And so I was, as soon as I could wear sneakers and he had me running and we had a big bag down in the tenement in the basement. And I hit the big bag and, and hit the light bag and, and my dad was training me. I was to be light heavyweight champion of the world. That became my consuming desire. During those years in, in Brooklyn, New York and Manhattan and, and the five boroughs, they had boxing clubs all over the city. And so I, was, I joined the Ocean Avenue Boxing Club. By the way, great fighters have come out of there. Floyd Patterson, world heavyweight champion, came out of my boxing club there in, in, New, in Brooklyn, New York. Murray Glazier, one of the great middleweights, came up out of the same boxing club. And so I began to train three hours a night, five nights a week. I started in the Pee Wee Boxing Club. And then I went further and further and further into boxing. And I was really wanting to get into it. And, and I wanted to, to really make a name for myself. And... I remember I kept bugging my coach. I, I got to get in the ring, man. I got to make something of myself. I got to, you know, I got to fight. And you see, the police thought if we could only get boxing clubs all over the city, we'd get the kids in the boxing clubs and they'd stop fighting in the streets. Little did they know, the better you were in the ring, the better you were in the street. So I was in Ocean Avenue Boxing Club. It wasn't a very, we, we weren't a very rich boxing club. I mean, I remember when I, I was a little kid, I... I was, I was wanting to fight and get my first tournament fight. And all the boxing clubs would come once a year to Coney Island, to the great arena there in Coney Island. And they would fight to see which boxing club was the toughest boxing club in New York. And I was, by then I was a light heavyweight. I was under 16 years old when I first my, fought my first amateur fight. In fact, I was too young to fight in the Golden Gloves, my first amateur fight. And I stepped into the ring. I remember it even now. I stepped in the ring. And by the way, my ring name was, get this, New York News, New York Mirror, New York Times called me in the sports section, up and coming, Killer Halverson. That's hard to believe this pretty face. <laughs> Killer Halverson. I remember my first tournament fight. And, and uh, you know, we wasn't a very rich boxing club. We didn't have these fancy boxing shoes and boxing trunks. And, you know, I had a kind of bathing suit on and... We had one mouthpiece in our boxing club. Yeah. Someone get knocked out, they drunk, boom, out and dipped in alcohol and you're next. I remember I stood in a ring first time and in that ring and, and I was fighting a boy from the CYO, the Catholic Youth Organization, a wonderful boxing club in New York. And, and he got down in the corner, said a little prayer, you know, and I knew he had something going for him that I had going for me because I didn't even believe in God. And the bell rang and I came out and here I am growing up in the Brooklyn streets. I have no thought for God. I have no thought for anyone. I have no thought for any person. I just want to hurt. And I come out the first round and I feel, felt like Paul the Apostle's fighter. You ever read about him in the Bible? He says he beateth the air. Well, I felt like Paul, because here I was beating the air. He was beating up on my head. Finally, the bell rang, and I found my way to the corner, sat down. My manager, he was a great optimist, he looked in, he said, Hey, man, you're doing great. I said, No, you're looking at the wrong man. He's in the purple trunks. He's looking great. I'm looking bad. By then, my eyes swelling up, and I'm hurting in places I didn't even know I had. And second round, I went out, and I'm looking, and I'm fighting like Paul the Apostle's fighting. He hit me with a left, and left hook, or it doesn't matter when you hit, you hit. And I mean, when leg goes one way and the other the other way and you're going the other way and everything's turning around I'm flat on my back killer Halverson and this guy one you know they talk about a fast count I never had a fast count two almost as long as brother Phipps holds the notes Ooh. I ran out of breath almost fainted back in the backstage so here I am, Killer Halverson, nine, bell rang. Now in those days, they called it Saved by the Bell. I didn't want to get saved, believe me. I mean, I, I wanted to get home, but they lifted me up, brought me to the corner, took out the smelling sauce, waved it under my nose, and then he asked the dumb questions. How many fingers on my hand? The guy had ten fingers on one hand. <clears throat> I remember he said this. He said, you want me to throw in the towel? You know what that means? You want to give up? Hey, I said, no man, my bleeding in my mouth. I said, no man, I've taken enough punishment from him. I'm not going to give up. 
don't throw in the towel. Went out the third round, knocked him through the ropes. I became the light heavyweight champion the city of New York, 1952-1953. I knocked out the Eastern Golden Glove champion. I was 15 years old. I couldn't fight in the Golden Gloves. He was 27 years old. Because you fight by weight, not by age. And everywhere you'd read in the sports page, and that day, Ron Halverson, Killer Halverson. And so I'm making a name for myself in the ring, and I'm making a name for myself in the street. But you see a person... But you know, I learned a lesson there. And I tell young people wherever I go, you know, sometimes you're knocked down. Satan knocks you down. And and I mean, you're flat out. You think, well, I might as well give up. What's use being a Christian? And and then the manager comes through the ropes, lifts you up. That's Christ. He puts you in the corner, takes out the smelling salts. That's grace. And he revives you. I tell you, never give up. You hear me? Do you say amen out here? I don't know. You're you're strange to me here. Do you say amen? I mean, never give up. You may be in hell today, but you can be in heaven tomorrow. Hey, listen to me. You may be down today, but you can be up tomorrow because His grace is sufficient for us all. He sang about that tonight. There I was, Killer Halverson in the ring, made my name, but a person didn't really achieve in my neighborhood until he became a member of a gang. Now, I'm not talking about a bunch of boys standing on street corners looking for trouble. They were organized gangs in New York. There were over 200 fighting gangs. Upwards to 400 fighting members in one gang. They were organized. They had a president, vice president, light up man. He took care of the weapons. There was council of war and there was the council of war and there was the treasurer of the gang. And, and every time you would go against the other gang, the council of war and the, and the weapons free expert, they would go and they would set the rules for the rumble. And so being Killer Halverson and Hating law and hating myself and hating my parents and hating everything. Man, I wanted to show that hate. I wanted to bring that hate out in violence. I wanted to be cool, man. I wanted to be in the gang. Now, you don't just join the gang. You're initiated into the gang. And since we lived on the beaches at Coney Island, they took me down to Coney Island, ripped off my t-shirt, rolled me in the salt water in the sand, tied me to a piling, took out the big garrison belt with the buckle and was whipping me. And there was a soldier on one side, they called them soldiers. On the other side with switchblade out, if you cried out, they'd come up under your armpit or they'd carve a C in your forehead or in your back. And so I was beaten into submission. I would not cry out. And I was initiated into the beachcombers. By the way, there were many b- gangs there in Brooklyn, New York. The Mau Mau's, the Bishops, the Swords, the Gay Blades. There was, there was the gang called the Chaplains. They were 800 strong. The largest gang in the city. And don't let chaplains fool you. They were notorious. But I was initiated in the beachcombers. And by the way, every gang flew its colors, or what they called flying their colors, and black leather jacket and skull and blood dripping over the skull. And in red letters, beachcombers. And I was brought in as a soldier into the beachcombers. And I fought my way up. I became vice president. I was vice president of one of the most notorious gangs in the city of New York. We saw the Mau Mau's coming. We fought the Mau Mau's. They buried them in the sands. Coney Island. I can't describe for you when 400 guys go to war in, in, a, in a great open lot or, or come together in an athletic field and they come together with baseball bats drilled, filled with lead, with stiletto blades, push button blade, come out, go through three quarter inch piece of plywood. I made my first zip gun when I was 14 years old. I was breaking and entering by the time I was 15. I was stealing cars, ripping off cars by the time I was 15. I'd committed almost every crime except rape and murder by the time I was 16. And I was now vice president of the beachcombers. We went to rumble, we went to war. And my best friend one night in a rumble, he had his head blown off his shoulders. He died in a pool of blood with a sort of shotgun. And I was running away and said, Johnny, it was good knowing you, Johnny. He's gone, he's blown away, he's no more. They found my friends in trunks with eyes blown out. And they crossed the other gang. And, and when the Mau Mau's came, you saw them with their, with their blaze with their blazers, athletic blazer, red blazer, and they're on the back, two M's in gold, the Mau Mau's, and they carried a cane, and they pull apart the cane, there was 18 inch blade, so every time we saw a Mau Mau, he lifted his cane, we smashed him, stepped him, stuck him, stepped him in, on his head, pushed him into the street. And seeing young boys with their stomachs slit open, crying for their mothers in a Brooklyn street, seeing young boys, their eyes shut out, listen to me, slit open in their in their stomach slid open, feeling a switchblade in your back as I did one night there in a Brooklyn street. There was no hope for me. I was lost.
With every scar, with every hate, with every fight, I became more hateful. I went to a high school, by the way, they wrote the book called The Blackboard Jungle. That's the school I went to. It was a jungle. We're up the upside, up-down staircase, and you'd find young men with switchblades stuck in their stomach. Someone robbed them for their cookie money. Or else they overdose. By the way, there's no, there's no honor among drug addicts. They'd overdose and, and they'd take him up on the roof of the school and, and they'd take his, the best clothes they could get so they could sell it and throw his body off into the, into the yard. On every card of that school, the Blackboard Jungle, will you meet Grady Vocational High School, Brooklyn, New York? Every card of there was policeman station. We went on strike for a minute more for lunch and thousand boys would go out, stand stomping around. When I played basketball for William E. Grady and the other teams came in, their cheerleaders came in, the whole 60th precinct would be standing in a row blocking the cheerleaders to protect them. One day, the first day at school, in high school, I took the teacher on the fifth floor, hung him out from the window, the fifth floor, his head towards the concrete. I said, we're going to have no homework this year. And we had no homework. I was 17 years old and I couldn't read or write. And I was going through high school. But God began to move in my neighborhood. And there I was, beachcomber fighting the Mau Mau's and the swords and the bishops. Losing my friends to prison. Losing my friends to the street. Losing my friends to drugs. And here's Ron Halverson. He's lost. Hopeless. My mother had given up on me. I mean, the teachers had given up on me. The, the cops had given up on me. I mean, all they wanted to do was lock me up, get rid of me. I remember one day my mother was called in the principal's office and I came in and there was black leather jacket, skull, blood, and switchblade in my pocket. And he said, Mrs. Halverson, your boy's a bum. He's no good. He'll never amount to anything. And on the way home, my mother cried. She said, Ronnie, I don't know what I'm going to do with you. And I, I didn't know anything then. I said, well, Mom, this, don't worry about it, man. Be cool. Hey, listen to me. My mother couldn't help me. The law couldn't help me. The teachers couldn't help me. Only Jesus Christ could help me. But I didn't know that. God began to move in my neighborhood. His spirit moved in my neighborhood. One young teenage boy was converted to Christ. He received Christ into his life personally as a Savior. And right away, when he received Christ, he wanted to share Christ. He wanted to tell others about Christ. Have you met people like that? Are you like that? You can't help but to tell others about Jesus Christ. And so I remember he, he, he had a Bible in his hand, and there I was standing on the street corner looking cool, man. You'd think the Fonz was cool. He wasn't cool. I was cool. And he came up and says, Hey, Ron. I said, I said to him, I said, hey man, we're going to steal this car. Why don't you come? We're going to go for a joyride down Belt Parkway. We're going to go up into the bishop's uh, clubhouse. We're going to throw a firebomb. And hey man, we're going to have fun. He looked at me strange. He says, no, I'm a Christian now. <laughs> I laughed at him. I said, you? Remember last week? You know, it's wonderful to know tonight that God forgets last week. You know, God has the shortest memory. When it comes to our sin, and the longest memory, when it comes to our need. And I said, man, I don't believe in God. I mean, religion is for old people. You have one foot in a casket, the other on a banana peel, that's when you get religion. But I want to live it up, forgetting someday I'd have to live it down. I play hooky. I don't know if they call it hooky out here. That's when you're supposed to be in school or not. I played hooky so much, I had my own tune officer. My mother spent more time in high school than I did. And one day I was playing hooky. I was going down past, I got as close to the front door of school, and I turned around, started back, and I noticed a friend of mine, Richard Kelly, just coming down the street towards school. And I said, hey, Rich, where you been? He was up at reform school, just got out. He's breathing a fresh air. It's fresh in Brooklyn when you've been in form school. So he says, hey man, I'm going to school. I said, you don't want to go to school, same teachers. I said, let's play hooky. He says, no man. He says, they catch me, I'm in trouble. They know where we go under the boardwalk. We go down and shoot dice. We go down to the pool hall. I mean, 
And just then I thought about this Christian who was sharing faith and trying to witness for Christ. Because you see, this young man left the high school. He went out to a Christian school. He was going to a Christian high school in Queens. And I thought about him. And I said, hey man, we used to call him, we used to call him Isaiah. <laughs> I used to laugh at that. Little did I know when I got converted, they called me Jeremiah. But we said, I said, remember Isaiah? He said, yeah, man. I said, let's go out to that school, a Christian school. Who will look for you and me? Richard Kelly. Who will look for you and me in a Christian school? And that was logic even for Richard. Now, in Brooklyn, New York, the subway becomes an elevator train in lower Brooklyn. And what we used to do, we used to kind of climb up over the stairs and run up over the third rail, jump over the tracks. You couldn't hit the third rail, you fry. You run between the trains, you get crushed and save 15 cents in those days, token. And there I got to this Christian school. Can you imagine? Richard, just out of reform school. There I was, black leather jacket, skull, blood dripping, scars on my hands, in my heart. And I walk into this school, looking cool. And it seemed so quiet, man. I was in a, used to a school. I mean, I'm telling you, this school was bad. I mean, they'd be shooting it out with the cops from the rooftops. I mean, in that school, all of a sudden, the police would surround the classroom, then come in, drag someone off, wouldn't see them six months, yeah. Overdosing and dying on the, on the, in the hallways of the school. And this was my school. And now I come in here, it's quiet. I said, hey, I turned to my friend, I laughed. I said, this can't be a school, this is a morgue. I mean, it's too quiet. Just then, a woman teacher came down the center, and she, she says, C can I help you? They were having trouble with kids in the neighborhood. And I said, yeah, man. Now, we knew the difference, but that was cool. I said, yeah, man, we're looking for Isaiah. I mean, Jim, 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 uh, Landis, he go to school here. She said, yes, he's up in chapel. I've never been in a chapel in my life. I know what a chapel was. And I looked at her strange. She says, well, that's like assembly in public school. But in a Christian school, they call it a chapel. So she said, would you like to go up? I said, yeah, don't want to go out. As I put my hand on the door to a chapel, listen to this, never before in a chapel. I mean, here I hate God, if there was a God. And she said this, I'll never forget it, I even remember now. She said, oh, by the way, it's week of prayer. I, I mean, I broke out. I, 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 I just, I mean, I collapsed. I, I laughed. I mean, I turned to my friend, I said, Richard, man, I can't pray ten seconds. How do they pray for a whole week? <laughs> and that was my first encounter with God. I went into this chapel and sat in the last row in the last seat. Black leather jacket, looking cool, man. Blood dripping over the skull. Beachcombers. Ron Halverson, light heavyweight champion in the city of New York. Ron Halverson, vice president of Beachcombers. Ron Halverson lived with the switchblade, lived by the order of the gun. And there's a preacher up front talking about God. So I kind of slid in my seat, forgot, you know, I mean, shh. Looking cool, looking at the chicks. Hey, don't ever slide down in your seat when I'm here. I'll send the Holy Spirit after you. You hear me? <laughs> yeah, I'll send the Holy Spirit after you. I kind of slid down. And this preacher, I didn't hear a word. That afternoon, we stole a boat. My brother and I and my friend, we wanted to go fishing. I love fishing even now. My wife, every time I come home from fishing, just catch any. I said, no, honey, I went fishing. Now, catching is another sport. But I stole this boat, my brother and, and my friend, and we rode out in a Gravesend Bay. If you ever go to Brooklyn, New York, and you come from Jersey, you come on over in the Staten Island, go over the Verrazano Bridge. You look off to the right, that's Coney Island. Now they have big, tall, they have these big, tall apartment buildings. They, it was old tenement buildings when I grew up. And, and I mean, that's Coney Island. And, and one time it was an island, now it's a peninsula. They kind of covered it up. And, but we stole a boat, we rode out in what they call Gravesend Bay, and that's where the East River and the Hudson River come together and narrows and then rush out along the beach and then are out into the Atlantic Ocean. And we're out there fishing and the storm came up, and, and by the way, the storm was getting fierce, and my brother said, hey man, you row and let's get going, water's coming over the boat. And, no, no, first he said, you bail and I'll row. I said, okay man, you, you row and I'll bail. And so I took off my motorcycle boot and I'm trying to get the water out of the boat and the boat's filling up. Hey, by the way, there's no atheists in sinking boats. You hear me? Bailing this boat out. And the, and the water's coming over faster than the boat. And Hey, man. And then my brother says, hey, you and I'm bailing. I said, hey, I'm bailing. You bailing. I'll row it. Then the tide changing. Two feet forward, six feet back. 
prayed my first prayer in a stolen boat in Brooklyn, New York. By the way, you don't have to be good to pray. If that's the case, no one would pray. Now, some of you think you're good, but I mean... I fell on my knees and I said, God! Yeah, interesting, I didn't believe in God to that moment. God, get me in and I'll be good. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Get me in. And I'll be good. You know, God hears the prayers of bad people. God hears the prayers of down and out people. God hears the prayers. There was a riff in the cloud. Have you ever been in a storm and kind of the, the clouds are ripped apart and the sun comes through right on that boat? Listen, I don't know why you're here, but I know why I'm here. A speedboat was coming by, hooked up, took us in. I got my feet on the ground. I forgot the prayer. Have you ever done that? Come on, have you ever done that? Doctor comes in serious. Looks bad. Oh, Lord, I'll be good. Please heal me. Get me well. I'll be... Hey, come on. Hey, the law is almost on your case and you say, oh God, get me out of this and I'll be good. I'll, I'll, I'll turn the leaf on. Come on now. God understands that. Next day I played hooky. I went out to this chapel. Preacher was there talking about God. God I didn't believe in. God I didn't believe in. That evening we were going to have a block party. Hey man, we used to have great block parties in Brooklyn. What we'd do, we'd take the ash barrels and we'd put it across the road here, so the street here, so no cars could come in there. Then we'd put it off this, this corner, this street. The cars couldn't come in here. We'd get the ghetto blaster blasting away, and then we'd have a cool party, man. The chicks would be there, you know, rock and roll. I used to rock and roll. I mean... And all the chick, I mean, we're going to have a great party. And the president of the gang, listen, the president, you see, the president of the gang, he would give us a slip of paper and say, this is what you're going to bring to the party. Had no money. I was taking all those things that aren't good for you now, but be good for you in heaven. Eclair, eclairs, lemon meringue pies, I mean, cakes, pies, pastries. And so I broke in the Brighton Beach Bakery, 2nd Street, Neptune Avenue. And I got a white box, you know those boxes, bakery boxes in New York, you know, kind of put all these cream puffs, all these good things. Hey, someone said, hey, you can have an apple tree in heaven. I'm going to have an eclair tree. I'm going to have an eclair tree. But anyway, I break in, I fill up all these boxes. Man, we're going to have a great party tonight. Why go out the back door or go out the front door? So I break out the front door. I get out on Neptune Avenue, 2nd Street, Brighton. And all of a sudden, a police car, 60th precinct, six blocks up, comes around on the avenue. And there I am. And right away, you, you see, we're all theological. We are all theolo- We're all spiritual. I dropped the cream puffs and started to run. Come on, that's in your nature, isn't it? Come on. You're cool with the boys, man. You shove it down, you know. Get rid of it. In your car, and all of a sudden lights go on, and you've got something in that car you don't want to... Hey, come on. I know what the fear is. I know what it is when you hear the door slam behind you. The bars. So looking cool, man. Having a cool time. Pew! My dry, I started running. You, it's hard to get traction in clean puffs. I mean... So I'm running down Neptune Avenue, and I duck down an alleyway, and all, all the streets have these alleyways between the tenements, and I'm running down, and I, I mean, I had run. I, they knew me, and they knew how fast I was, and I had to be fast to survive. And I'm running down this alleyway, and I think I'd get to the end, there'd be a big fence, I'd be up over it, man, I'm gone, they'll never find me. I come to the end, it's dead end. Boom. Another building, the back of a building. So being a theologian, I tried to get away from my sin, my crime. Now I'm going to try to rationalize. Well, officer, I was walking along Neptune Avenue and stepped in these cream puffs. Just then I looked and there was a fire escape. You ever see the fire escapes on the buildings? Huh? You see those fire escapes? I don't know if they have them here. These iron fire escapes. So I, I jumped up, pulled the ladder down, started up the fire escape. I'm running as fast as I could run. I mean, I'm, our neighborhood was so bad that the police even today walk and freeze. 
They were taught in my day, don't you leave your patrol car, because what we used to do, get them to chase us, get out of their patrol car, chase us, then two or three of our gang members jump in the patrol car, drive it off the bulkhead into the ocean. They were losing patrol cars. We'd get them up the, coming up the stairs, we'd throw ash barrels off the cover, or we'd shoot at them from the top of the roof. I mean, this was bad place. And I'm running down, and they're figuring when they're going to come in this alley, and I'm running up the stairs. I mean, I'm going up. You can't go up a fire escape quietly. Got to the roof by then. The police got in there and said, stop or I'll shoot, man. Hey, I was running so fast, would have outran his bullet. Up over the building, up over the next building, next building, man. And all that night, I'm gone. Whew. Next day, I play hooky. I'm out at that school. He talked about God, how this infinite God, in order to touch man, this God had to come into this world. He had to enter this world. And so he talks about this God coming down as a seed in a womb of a virgin. And I can't believe this man. What am I hearing here? So that he could get close to us. So that we might see love close up. He's talking about this and it's going over my head and yet things are hitting me. I'm trying to figure this thing out. That evening I was broke, man. I needed money bad. And by the way, sometimes when I needed money bad, I'd snatch pocketbooks. What I'd do is I'd hide in an alleyway and between uh, Van Sicklin Station and the Brighton Beach Projects and some old lady come by and I'd run out and grab the pocketbook and she yelled out, I'd kind of knock her down and run. That's what sin does to you. So I needed money bad that night and so I waited and she was walking along this little lady and I ran out, grabbed the pocketbook, but she held on. She was hanging on. Now in the past, all I'd do is, boom, knock her down. But all of a sudden, something came over my heart. I mean, I don't... I mean, I started to cry. Hey man, I never cried. In fact, my dad said, babe, boys don't cry. I didn't learn until later that Men cry, not boys. I started to cry and I let go of the pocketbook and I started running down the streets and up over the alleyway and amid the ash barrels. I sat there all night and I cried. I didn't know what it was then, but I know what it is now. It was the Holy Spirit. How do you explain it? Kid that lived by the switchblade. Lived by the law of hurting and killing. Or not killing, but hurting so bad. Living that law. How do you explain it? Next day I went out and listened to this preacher. He talked about this Christ who was crucified. He died on the cross. I thought, wow. That evening I was supposed to steal a car. We already cased it. We knew what was Cadillac there in Brighton Beach and 4th Street. My brother Billy was going and my other friend, another friend. And so it was getting dark and that's when we were going to go out. And I was just about ready to go out the door with my brother and my friend. And there was a knock on the door and there stood this boy, Isaiah. This Christian, he came with his Bible in his hand. He said, I come to study the Bible with you. And I said, all right, I want, to, I want to know something about God. My brother laughed at me, my friend. They went out that night. Hey, by the way, that night my brother was caught and my friend was caught. They were sent away to prison. If I'd gone out with them that night, I wouldn't send away to prison. Who knows where I'd be today? Hey, listen, the majority of my friends growing up in that neighborhood, 70, 65 to 70 percent of them, Spend their time in prison. The other percent are dead. And very few have come out. Even alive. And here I am, a boy knocking at my door, Bible in his hand. I heard about Christ for the first time that night. And God did something in my heart. Next day I played hooky. My friend Richard Kelly came with me. Now I told you about Richard. He's coming with me. Hey, listen to me carefully. Forget everything I say. Listen to me tonight. The preacher talked about Christ dying on the cross for the salvation. And there's a thief on the cross. And he says, I'll remember you in paradise. And I thought to myself, if God could die for a thief at a Jerusalem wall, why couldn't he die for a thief in a Brooklyn street? For the first time in my life, hope. For the first time in my life, light broke into my dark heart. I stood up to give my life to Christ. I turned to my friend Richard. Listen carefully. I said, Richard, come on, man. He said, no, man, I can't. He says, I know it's right, but I can't. It costs too much to be a Christian. Hey, by the way, Richard spends his life in prison for murder. 
And I travel around the world with the Bible in my hand, the love of God in my heart, sharing the good news of salvation. Can you say amen here in this place? That day I gave my life fully to Christ. I was an illiterate teenager. He took a switchblade and gun out of my pocket. He took a bottle out of my mouth. And right away I said, I've got to know more about him, so I have to learn to read. Seventeen years old, I couldn't read or write. I went to a public high school. I went to the public library and I got these little books, you know, about spot running and hit them in my black leather jacket and came home and was trying. One day my mother saw me. She says, what's wrong, son? You can't read? I said, no, mama, will you help me? So she helped me read my Bible. And by the way, the first person I led to Christ was my mother. Can you, you should say amen. The first person I ever led to Christ was my mother. I'll tell you, I learned something there. I learned it's more wonderful to serve Christ than to serve this world. I discovered there's more joy in Jesus than in jazz. Hey, listen, I found out that life has meaning. That there is purpose for every human being. And by the way, there's not only purpose for every human being. There is hope for every human being. And that hope is in Jesus Christ. Father, which art in heaven, I thank you tonight that I could bear my testimony from gangs to God. I don't know who these people are. I wish I could get to know each of them a bit better. But you know them. Hey, Lord, you know every hair on their head. You know every tattoo on their body. You know everything about them, the good things and the bad things. And but the greatest thing of all to know is that you love them, every one of them. You don't love them because they're good. You love them because they're your children. God, tonight I pray for them. There may be men and women here. There may be children here, young people here tonight, mothers and fathers, husbands, wives. That have bitterness in their heart, that have loneliness. I mean, they're, they're suffering with pain. I mean, the pain, the hurt. Some, Father, maybe are fighting out at you right now, but I pray like Saul of Damascus, that you'll touch them and they'll change them and make them a Paul. With every head bowed and every eye closed here tonight. I wonder if there's not someone here that maybe you've gone through this with yourself. And you want to say, God, I need help. Will you help me? Will you just lift up your hand quietly and let me pray for you? You say, God, I need help. He'll know what it is. I don't have to know what it is. God bless you. God bless you. Just hold your hand up. Don't be ashamed of him. He's not of you. Hold up your hand and say, hey, God, I do need help with this. And God bless you and God bless you there and God bless you there. There are not others here. Father, hey, it's Jesus speaking in your heart through the Holy Spirit. He wants to help you now. You say, I can't straighten up my life. No, don't straighten it up. Let God just take you and... And touch you now. Would you just lift up your hand and show him that. Say, Lord, I need it. God bless you, young man. God bless you there. Hands here. Hold it up. Keep it up. Don't be ashamed. I want to keep you in this prayer. God bless you. And God bless you there. All over this auditorium. Lord, touch them at their need. Satisfy them at their need. And give them the gift, we pray, of eternal life. In Christ's name. Amen.